In the Anfield Wrap, I am Neil Atkinson, and with me, uh, I have Gareth Roberts, uh, Kev Walsh, and Kiva O'Neill to talk about Liverpool's tremendous 1 0 victory away at Wolverhampton Wanderers. I say tremendous, Gareth, uh, because if we're all frank about it, there haven't been a ton of them recently. But also, I think you actually, one of the things you actually got to sort of see over the course of the match, I thought, was these are two sides whose current league position and overall form this season is a bit beneath them. I actually thought the quality of what was on show, I thought you got to see some really good players. I thought it was a good game. I thought it was an intense game. And I think Liverpool do well to win it in the end. They do. Uh, you know, Wolves start the game well. And, and Wolves causes problems. And, you know, Alisson... The penalty incident straight away almost and then and then straight after that they, they carve out another chance as well Wolves and it was a bit like you know you're watching it going well I want to see something from Liverpool I want that fast start that I've been asking for for so long <laughs> I want us to score a first half goal which ultimately we did manage to do but we left it to the very last second and mm. um, but yeah Wolves we'll, we'll shown over the 90 that they're a good side and you know I guess you know, Noddy Older and his mates this morning will be saying, you know, they could have had something out the game and yeah. and they were unlucky and all the rest of it. And it, it is two sides sort of punching below the weight. Um, but it was very much for me yesterday, just win, win in any way, win somehow. Because, you know, we've seen Liverpool lose nine times since the turn of the year, uh, win only six times before yesterday. And it was just getting desperate. You know, we, we we really, really needed something to pin our hopes on. And we've got something to pin our hopes on now. We've got this uh, three-week break. And I think, had we been talking about a defeat again this morning, you know, that would be really the spirit, not only for us, but for everyone. You know, because to have three weeks of, of crisis journalism about Liverpool would have been heavy. Um, as I'm sure, <laughs> as I'm sure, Kiva can back me up on. So you know, for for us now to have a chink of light, for us to have a possibility that we can get top four, for us to be able to look forward to that Champions League draw, I'll take all that in the circumstances all day. Just on the way the game starts and how quickly Wolves start, what I was really impressed with Gareth was how Liverpool stood up and were countered in every facet of the game. Really, they looked to play the football when they got it down, but they also they're happy to have a bit of a scrap. I think it's fair yeah. to say. We'll talk more about that later on, but it would have been easy for Liverpool to have maybe wilted a little bit after that first 10, um, you know, with the way in which Molyneux is. And yes, there's not fans in, but Wolves, I thought, were looking really, really intent on stamping their authority on the match. And Liverpool don't let that happen. And I think that that's to the credit of the minute. They haven't let their heads drop in the league. Yeah, absolutely. Because it'd be very easy for them to, you know, six defeats on the spin at Anfield. Uh, to use the word again, is obviously the spirit, and um, you know, to be the champions and then have it leveled at you that you know you're the worst champions ever, which is a crap shout, but it's a, it's a shout that's happening. Um, I, I think it would be easy for the for the heads to go down, and I think Wolves sort of, you know, could see a wounded animal in front of them and and, and wanted to come out and have a go at us, and they did that, and they were playing with confidence, given you know how they like they've been. It's been grim for them as well. They haven't been scoring first half goals all season. I think it is or something mad like that. Um, they haven't seen the side win many times, so you know their confidence was low as well. So I, I thought it was interesting to see how the side started, but it looked to me that Wolves started going. We've got a chance against these, you know. Look at all the sides that you know they're losing to and all that kind of thing. But you're right to say that Liverpool did show up, uh, show up basically. And also, you know, to, to coin a phrase that me and you once went toe to toe on, loads of character. Um, <laughs> because, and, and that, that was what was needed. I mean, you know, the, the, the centre halves on the day is, is a 20 year old lad, let's, let's not forget, who, who's, who's hardly played in this league. And another lad who's doing interviews the other day saying, got to be honest with you, never thought to get a chance at this level. And I'm going to frame my share when I played in the Premier League and put it on the wall. So, you know, those two lads were, were both great, Kabak and Phillips, I thought, you know, stuck in, uh, stuck to the task. And look, it was difficult as well. I think Klopp said in his um, his press conference afterwards that at times, you know, with Triori, you just, you can't defend against the lad because mm. he's so big and so fast. He will cause you problems and he caused those problems. But they, they manfully stuck to the task all the way through. They got the win. They dug in. Klopp called it a dirty win. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant way to describe it for a German fella nailing the English again. Um, Kiva, it was a dirty win. And Liverpool throughout, as I said before, you know, there's a lot of intensity in the match. Um, it's one of the fastest and most intense games I can remember as being involved in during the last 12 months. It reminded me a little bit of Brighton away last season, which was a game that almost got a bit out of hand. 17 fouls to Wolves as 10 fouls as well. 
I think there was a real desire, wasn't there, from Liverpool that they weren't they weren't going to be run all over by what is a very very big Wolves team too. Yeah, they were fouling all over the pitch, wasn't he? For being out, Thiago probably won too many times. He eventually got that yellow card, didn't he? Which has now become just a staple of his game, and um, which is maybe a little bit worrying. But I think he, you know, he showed against Leipzig that he, he can sort of, you know, do it um, to a better effect almost. Um, I thought the midfield were. If you compare it directly to the Leipzig game, they probably didn't have their best game. But again, you know, they were just chopping and getting in there and, and breaking up play, which I think they needed to do against, you know, a Wolves team who aren't, you know, um, I don't know, they won't press you so intensely, will they? But they've, they've got so much quality on the ball. I think, you know, you look at some of those players in there, you know, Ruben Neves, Jal Moutinho, they've, they've got quality. Um, and that's always a worry when you've got the likes of, like Gareth mentioned, the Dharma Traore running at you. He's just such a headache, isn't he? Like, I hate playing Wolves every season, every season, just because watching him is just like, I think he's one of the most dangerous players in the league and it it will continue to shock me. I know Wolves are having a bad season, but how he's just not um, making more, you know, goal contributions just because he's just getting into the right spaces. And obviously, we know, Raul Jimenez is, is injured, unfortunately. And I think he'd be the big man in there, you know, getting on the end of a lot of those crosses. But, you know, he's, he's just a frightening player to come up against, um, you know, um, but I think Liverpool did handle him and, you know, the other players pretty well. And it was a different kind of game, I think, that we've seen. Um, it was weird because you mentioned that Brighton game. I had a kind of like, like the one game this season, I thought Liverpool were absolutely awful. And, but I think Southampton was, was that game. But Southampton were brilliant. But their intensity everywhere, they were just closing them down. Mm-hmm. Wolves didn't do that. But there was still this weird level of intensity in the game. And I think that was just from them getting forward and, you know, a little bit, we, we talk about their quality, but a, a little bit more of a, a clinical finish from them. And, you know, this game could have been well put beyond Liverpool. I thought, you know, like Gareth mentioned, Alisson looked a little bit shaky again. Um, but then, you know, he sort of just was steady as well. So I think he was kind of like the whole sort of team have been this season in one game, um, just sort of like off and on a little bit. Um, but yeah, I thought, you know, it wasn't the midfielders' finest games, but they broke up play so, so well and it was so needed. There is, Kev, in general, it's really interesting with Wolves. Kiva's just said there, the games against them, you don't look forward to them, they're really, really hard. Since they've come up, we've now won all six uh, against them. And they play in such a structured way, you know, certainly when the face does, I mean, they've tried to change it this season and it might be part of why they've stuttered a little bit at times, but they play in such a structured way you sort of know where the battles are. The number of times, for instance, Thiago either wins it or makes that foul when they're going to drop it into a certain midfield area because he is absolutely charging in, going, I know what you do next. I've watched the videos, lads. You're going to put it there and then he's going to turn. So all I've got to do is I've got to get right on top. And if I, if I nick it, great. And if not, I'm going to stop you turning. And you get to see that over and over. And I think it's dead interesting that this Liverpool team, you know, will do have a style of play where they look after the ball, they move the ball, they look to get it forward, they look to play into certain areas. They have a style of play. They don't just sit in and have a shell. And I think that the, the more it became a game, the more Liverpool, to me, looked like they were going, oh, we can have games like this in the Premier League as well, can we? Great. And I thought Liverpool looked like they were really enjoying themselves with the idea of getting a dirty win. By the time you get to about the 65th minute mark, they were really, really into the task. Yeah, I think, you know what that comes from? It comes from having players playing in the natural positions. So you've got Nat Phillips, and if the ball's coming over the top, you know Nat Phillips is absolutely 100% going to win the head and no issues at all. Kabak knows that he has to drop off. And Carragher highlighted it on the Sky Sports last night saying that they they were covering for each other. Yeah. As much as they were covering for each other, as you've just said there, the midfielders know when they go and need to, they make a foul because whoever... Say for being yours, pushed a little bit further forward. Thiago knows you got to make the foul in there. I think that type, that side of your game, is a lot easier to play when you've got everybody playing in that position somewhere where they've been playing since they were 10, 11 years of age. So the centre half feel more comfortable doing it, then the central midfielders feel more comfortable doing it. And I think having Jotter up front just in, injects that little bit of just a little bit more tenacity than we've seen from the, the front three in this season. And I think he made the others up their game. So the fact that everyone's doing that, even the fullbacks, the defensively, they were excellent going forward. Mm. I thought Robertson was really good as well. He had, he had a real go at it. But 
they knew what they, they knew what the battles were and they knew that they were able to win them individually. And then, as you say, sometimes it's just good to get that type of game in, like a scrappy game where we've probably had a lot of games where we haven't got what we deserved, really. And this is one where we felt like we had to really have the battle to win and to get what we deserved. And in the end, we did get what we deserved, I thought. We, we were good value for the win. When you talk about, I think it's really interesting with the center halves. I think that when Liverpool, Liverpool's ideal is to have Gomez and Van Dijk. We know that, Kev. And they almost, yes, Gomez and Gomez and Van Dijk do cover for each other. But it's almost this idea that they will just defend 1v1. They'll just play 1v1 with you because we back, we back, they back themselves, we back them, they back each other. They play 1v1 and we go from there. I think it's really interesting that I think it's it's one of those subtle adaptations, but it's quite a significant one that they are they are covering for each other's shortcomings. The rest of the team are aware of where the shortcomings. The very head of that Phillips comes to win that sets up the goal. He charges over there because he wants to win it rather than leave it to Quebec. A couple of times Quebec ends up coming right the way round to right back on the cover for Phillips because he knows Phillips isn't going to be great in a foot race. And I think it's a really interesting shift really for this entire Liverpool side but specifically those players you know and I think Alexander Arnold sits a bit deeper because he's concerned about lads getting away from Phillips on that side so he's back there as well it's a reminder isn't it that you can talk about individual players and the strengths and weaknesses and they've all got them to an extent unless they are Virgil van Dijk but the way a football team works is you all cover for each other, you all work for each other, you all look after bits and pieces of space and you're able to know my mate he's not great at that so I've got to help him out well, that's, that's the subtle change that's being made. People have told, spoken a lot about Kloppy and unwilling to change his system. But yesterday is a change in system because the fullbacks are not bombing on. The fullbacks are not overlapping and they haven't been overlapping that much this season. But yesterday was very much about a back four. The back four done the job of a back four. Whereas normally you'd say it's a back three because one of them at least has bombed right the way forward. Or even just a two. Exactly, yeah. Or, yeah, or a two if you've got the, the main two lads in there. But even without the main two lads this season, we've seen we've sort of tried to keep exactly the same system where we let the fullbacks go, and it hasn't really worked for us. But last night was a style of was a change in style from Klopp. Now it wasn't a change in system where you go like three five two or anything like that, but it was a change that said the two centre halves, you know what you're going to do now, and it, it worked perfectly. Really, they, they had a couple of chances, but nothing. I don't think that was really that guilt edge. There was a couple of maybe they could have done a bit better with, but you'd expect the goalkeeper to save. But I think the fact that the two centre-halves feel like, OK, I've got another centre-half here who knows what he's doing. And listen, as I read a, someone, I can't remember where I've read it this morning, but someone's made the point that centre-half partnerships don't get worse the longer they play together. The only, <laughs> the only, It's true, isn't it? They only improve, and now they've played the third most number of minutes this season for a Liverpool centre-half partnership. They've kept three clean sheets. The only goal they actually can see is a penalty, I think. So, they're learning each other's games by the game. And I think last night is a perfect example of you can have two players that are not the same level as what we had. And what we've had to do is we've made slight adaptations to the system. And you've seen how well that's worked for them. And going forward for the rest of the season, especially with this three-week break coming up now, it's only going to improve. They're not going to, they're not going to, I wouldn't imagine, drop their levels. They're only going to go one way. And the more that they go one way, the, the more the rest of the team go, OK, well, we can trust them a little bit more now. And you'll probably see a little bit more freedom going forward then as well. Gareth, on, on, that, on the centre-halves on both of them, Phillips very much does do the billing. Um, he gives it away a couple of times, but the one thing I would say is that there are times where his range of passing I actually think is quite impressive. The one who I think stood out of the pair over the course of the 90 minutes even though he doesn't do anything that's sort of overtly outstanding, was Kabak. I thought he read the game brilliantly. He was always where he needed to be. Even when he got legged by Traore towards the very end, as you say, he's very, or as the manager said, he's very, very difficult to deal with. And you've just got to sort of stay close to him at times. I thought I was really, really pleased with Kabak, especially in the context of the fact that he is only 20 years old. There's, there was such a maturity to his performance. He's almost happy to let Phillips sort of run amok a little bit, knowing he's going to anticipate and pick up the pieces. Yeah, I thought he was good. Uh, his best game for us, I'd say. And you look, you know, he's he's twenty years old, as you've just said. He's, he's available for eighteen million quid. Um, I think there's already a strong case there to say take that up, get him on board, and have him in. Uh, he's not going to be first choice when everyone's back. Uh, but that's fine. You know, you got you got plenty to work with there already. You can see it. You can see there's a footballer there. You can see there's someone stylistically. Uh, that would suit Liverpool, which is probably the problem for Nat Phillips in that he's jobbing and he's a, you know it's a great story and we're all made up for him. But you know, longer term, how, how many games is he going to get for Liverpool? Probably not, not not that many. And I think even he he would admit that. But we 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 come back. 
you know, I think we've got to look at sort of what Klopp likes to do with signings. And, you know, you've seen players miss sort of half a season or more almost mm. while they're getting acclimatised. There's none of that. He's, he's come straight in and he's come straight into a Liverpool side, like I said before, in crisis. A Liverpool side that's under the microscope that everyone's looking at. Everyone's talking about the defence. Everyone's talking about them being shaky, how easy they can see goals. So the moment he steps into the side, everyone's looking at him. Especially in in terms of how how the deal was done, the fact that it was last minute, everyone's saying you know it was a bit of a supermarket sweep. They got in whoever they could get in, and so you know for that reason alone, everyone will be clocking his performances more so than maybe anyone else on the pitch at times. So that will have been difficult for him. And I seen a tweet earlier from uh, Henry Winter where he was saying about sort of you know the first few games he was regularly getting booked. Uh, obviously Liverpool were conceding goals. As Kev mentioned, now you know we've got a three clean sheets from this from this pairing, but also he's not getting booked anymore. Ad, and he just looks a little bit more assured, and it's not been perfect for him. But you know, you say like the, he just sort of jobbed in the in the game. They both they both jobbed, but there was a moment I can't remember precisely who it was now, but I just remember Tyler getting really excited for one of the few moments in the match that he did get excited about when he thought Wolves had a chance, basically. Yeah. On the right hand side, as they were and Kabak just area. popped yep. up. Kabak had seen it. Kabak had, had clocked the danger, turned up, mopped up, got in the way, and that was that. And Wolves didn't score. So you know he, he's doing his job, but also I think you can see that there's a bit more to his game in that he can he can play a ball, that he can carry the ball, um, and so yeah, it, it's all good stuff. It's positive stuff, and it's great to be having a conversation that is positive about Liverpool and about Liverpool centre half because it's been it's been a grind talking about both Liverpool and the defence this season. So to be able to talk about something positive and, and, and it's still mad. It's, you know, what Kev just said before is mad. Like it's it sort of, we just say casually, oh, oh yeah, you know, that's the, that's the partnership with the third most minutes now in the league. <laughs> I mean, what the fuck? And like, you know, and, and literally like the, it, it's, it's the second time there's been an unchanged side or all season. Season's nearly finished. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like I think, we, like we shouldn't sort of downplay how mad and how hard it's been for Liverpool, and how there are mitigating circumstances all the way through, reasons, not excuses. So to, to start to emerge from the make with a bit of hope now is is good stuff. And uh, I read your thing, Neil, where you're saying don't look at the league table. I've already looked. Don't mate. look at the league table. I've look already look looked. <laughs> don't look it in the eye. <laughs> I've already, it looks better than the other day. I'm more above Everton. <laughs> listen, listen, look at it in May. All I'm saying, I'm just asking you to hang on, give it a month and a half, and then look away and we'll see where things are. Uh, also, because not least, my thing on that is the, the the dangled carrot of fourth. Listen, I just want them to go and win a seventh European Cup. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, that's 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 that my do. aims. Uh, it would indeed do. Um, a player who's come in for a bit of stick in terms of his defending keeper <laughs> over the course of the campaign has been um, Trent Alexander Arnold. And I think that some of that's been. Fair in that I'm, I think he himself would feel in a couple of one on one situations he could have done things a little bit better, a little bit differently. But I think Pedro Neto gets very little change out of him over the course of the 90 minutes. William Jose goes over that side, gets very little change out of out of Arnold. And then also his work on the cover three or four times, especially as that game was reaching its conclusion, I thought was tremendous. And I think that has improved over the course of this campaign. I think he's he's become in a sense, a really, really good conventional fullback when he's defending. And I mean, all of that is a massive compliment. Yeah, and a lot of the times people would sort of, you know, try and, you know, pick holes in his in his game just because he's brilliant and that's what people will do. And it was always sort of the defensive side that they'd be like, oh, you know, can, can, he, can he sort of cope? And, you know, he loves getting forward. We know that. We love the numbers of, of assists. He, he, you know, the goals he creates. But then it was all about, like, can he get back and defend properly? But I think he's been doing that for a long time anyway. But, like, last night against Sheffield United, I think having Phillips there and Kabak, he kind of, like, has taken on this, like, leadership role, which I don't yeah. think we've seen from him in, in past seasons because there's been Van Dijk there, even Gomez there. You know, there have been players who are older, even on the other side. There's, there's Robertson, who you do think is, you know, the the senior one of, of the fullbacks and... um. And I think, you know, to see him now 
doing what he's doing. And last night just controlled the game. Obviously, Quebec sort of runs away with the, the man of the match award. And, you know, there's other shouts for Jota, who I thought was brilliant. He was all over the pitch and now Phillips, obviously. But Trent, again, has done exactly what he did against Sheffield United and sort of gone away where people have been thinking about his performance. But, he, you know, it's, it's like you, you don't get the man of the match award because that's sort of the level you just need to put in anyway and that's kind of like sort of what Ginny Wijnaldum does in the midfield it goes unnoticed I think Trent's doing that at right back defensively um, and he just looks I don't know even his passing effort looks crisper doesn't it it looks he looks fresher and I think you know we're talking about mitigating circumstances I'm sure it was Trent who you know missed the pre-season because I think he had COVID and you know that sort of you know does affect you like we don't know scientifically how it affects you but it affects you and obviously just to miss pre-season anyway as a, a footballer it does mean you have to come back later and get into your stride a little bit then you're losing the best defensive duo Liverpool have seen in years the best defender in the world so you've got that then to sort of like reshape your game when really you know Trent has, would probably like to be starting to to creep into midfield and to get forward. And, you know, that's that's his bread and butter, isn't it? But now we're seeing something which I think will come, you know, will actually benefit Liverpool in the long run this season because, you know, players are having to to do different jobs more so than, than they have done in the past. Obviously, there's always going to be wingers running at him. He's always going to have to cope with that. But sort of the filling in and, and the reading of the game, is just, you know, now he has to read it more so. And you see, and like you mentioned, Quebec and Phillips are reading each other's game well. You know, Trent's having to read that whole line and forward and who's there. And I just feel like that wasn't always a thing. And now it is. And he's absolutely, you know, um, he, he's back to his best. I just think that those assists will start, those numbers will start creeping up. And then obviously if you can continue defensively, I mean, what a player. On the keeper, Kev, he makes a couple of... He has the early, big early wobble where he, he arguably does just get away with one and that happens in football sometimes. He then also does that slightly mad punch uh, when he could just come and collect, uh, which doesn't breed calm. But his general presence breeds calm and I think it is the most underrated aspect of his game. He just... I think he just relaxes everyone. His decision-making second half is something he could come for and make himself vulnerable really late in the game. And he just he just gambles on, this lad's not going to work it properly. I'll be all right here. I think all the way through the match, I think after he, he makes those couple of early ones, I think he's just he's just such a calm and influence. And it's really strange to see how quickly, you know, he can make two errors and everyone forgets them and he forgets them. And that's that sort of his aura. Well, that, that, that is the calm aspect of it, isn't it? He... he... It's a penalty, in my opinion. That that first one in the couple in the first couple of minutes is a hundred percent a penalty. If, we, if that happens to Mane in the box, we're absolutely screaming for it. But the fact that he can do that, then the punch one, I thought, oh, is his head not right here? It, it was a couple. It was what two and twenty minutes or whatever. And I thought, oh, he might be having a bit of a ropey game yet. And some of his kicking wasn't great either in that first half. But then, as you say, he's got the ability to just settle himself down, and by doing so, he then settles the whole team down around him. He made a good save in the first half as well off the one. It, it would have been given offside, it turns out, but it was low to his left-hand side as the lad had come through. Mm. And it was just one of those, it, the lad slams it. The fact that he got down to it, I just thought, what a great save that was. And the likes of that will give the defence around him, and even the midfield to an extent, the, the confidence to then play their own game. And I think having him in goal and then having two centre-halves as young as they are, just allows you to think, okay, well, they all know what they're doing. Like in any specific any situation that arises, they know where approximately to be and who's going to be coming for what. Now, obviously, Kabak and him had that issue with uh, Leicester, didn't he? Where he's come out and yeah. you don't, I don't always to blame. I, I blame Kabak, but I think maybe that's just because I'm in the uh, the goalies union. <laughs> like, so I'm always gonna I'm always gonna stick up for him. But there was none of that last night. There was nothing that made you think, oh, these these are not talking or these are not communicating. I think it's to Alisson's eternal credit because obviously what he's gone through in the last few weeks is absolutely horrendous, but he still manages to be such a relaxed and calm and influence on the pitch on a team that probably, if you if you put all things together, shouldn't be relaxed and calm really with the centre half that they've got. They've got no right to look as composed as they, as they look last night and the goalkeeper is a massive issue. Well, not a massive issue, he's a massive part of that. 
on that, Kev, one of the things I think he does really well is he he continually, when he's in the in the in the groove, he saves things with a minimum of fuss. So there's the Ruben Neves effort, which he absolutely puts his foot through like nothing on earth. And there's some keepers where that has ended up looking like a bit of a drama. And Allison, I think you know he he wants to evoke calm. He doesn't want to do the save that looks great for the cameras. He's the absolute opposite of that. Actually, I mean, he looks great for the cameras, and it's you know it's a joy to behold. But he doesn't want to do the save that looks good for the cameras. He doesn't want to get that sort of attention. He'd rather evoke this idea of this is all easy, lads. You don't need to worry about me. I'm on top of all of this. I don't need to be the centre of attention. I'll just sweep the ball up and we'll go. That's as much for the opposition as it is for our, our team, now. Because never they do that free kick and Moutinho looks like he's going to hit it. To be fair, that's probably the most convincing like fake free kick I've ever seen. The little shuffle he done before, I was convinced he was going to hit it. But then Neves slams it and he's known for his free kicks. And as you say, he just pats it down and takes it. And it's as much to say to Neves, you can try that, mate, but I'm, I'm there all day for it. As it is for our defenders to go, it's great to have somebody like that behind us. And all that, you mentioned it there, it comes from concentration. But what it really comes down to with Alisson, and I've said it before, is his footwork. His footwork's phenomenal. He gets across the goal there to that Neves one without having to dive. He literally knows exactly where to put his feet and his concentration levels are such that he's not doing that thing a lot of goalkeepers do where they'll bounce all the time because they're nervous. He trusts his own, his own skills and his own instincts. And that's why he can make saves like that look routine. And he makes the vast majority of saves that he makes look routine because his concentration level's there. And he's got confidence in his own ability, so he's not he's not jumping at anything of what's going to happen next. He's also got a picture of how, how the game's going to develop, and he's he's the best in the world for me, I think. Um, one of the things that Liverpool do brilliantly, which is firstly, I don't think they've done at times this season, Gareth. They've not been ahead often enough, maybe to genuinely assess it. But I think <clears> they managed the game brilliantly in the second half. Wolves come out and have a little a little flurry uh, straight after the break. Liverpool push them back. But in part because of the manager's substitutions, in part because of just the general sort of direction of the game, it does really feel as though the time in the match sort of ebbs away between 60 and 80. The clock's just sort of moved on. Not a great deal's happened. Certainly not a great deal's happened around the Liverpool goal and all lads are able to look at each other and say, yeah, job nearly done here. Yeah, I think um, there was a telling point on that in, in what Klopp said afterwards where, I'm paraphrasing, but it was along the lines of like, you know, we don't have to put a show on, basically. We don't have to put a show on. We just need to win the game, and and you know I, I think we we can get romantic about the, the 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 league winning season. We did that loads then. Do you know what I mean? Of course yeah. we played some great football, and of course we racked up the records and all the rest of it. But we managed loads of games really well in that, in, in that season. We just we just got the win, you know somehow. Um, and, and there was a bit of that last night, and it was good to see that because it does feel like they do feel. You know, we're the champions, and and we've let people down, and and, and you know, you, you look at them, you know, you know, I, I, I'm traditionally not that into the body language thing. It feels a bit someone on Sky Sports does it, but the body language has not been great from 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 Liverpool players this season. At times, it does look like, and and in, in fact, Robertson has said, I think, as much that they've had the the weight of the world on the shoulders that they've been feeling sorry for themselves but there was this gritty determination just to see it out last night and you're right in in that it, it almost it, it's almost a hard game to talk about because they 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 made it in the second half and nothing and mm. nothing was fine and nothing was what we needed um and, and i think it's another reason that contributed to tyler talking an awful lot of nonsense even by his own standards um and and that was that was that was fine. That was what was needed. You know, you don't have to go gung ho all the time. You don't have to go and try and score three or four. What you do have to do is just get the three points on the board, and that's what they did. And I think you can easy sit here and nitpick and say it wasn't pretty and it wasn't perfect and it could be this and it could be that. But ultimately, the books will show that Liverpool won. That Liverpool got three points and that Liverpool are now. Five points behind Chelsea, and I've got a chance of fourth spot. I looked at the league, lad. I looked at it. <laughs> don't look at the league. Don't don't look at the league, uh, Kiva. On why Liverpool won the game and are whatever number of points they are behind Chelsea could be 103 for all I know. We uh, find ourselves praising again uh, Diogo Jota, who I thought over the course of the of the game was exceptionally combative. At times, I don't think his touch was great, but I think that applies for almost everybody on the pitch because it was so intense and it did speed up at times for everyone. Um, 
but he just puts himself into areas all the time. Um, he's got a really, really good knack. And I thought all three of the front three last night positioned themselves really, really well. Whatever they did when they got the ball, the positions that they took up were excellent before uh, they got the ball. But Jota sticks it in the back of the net and therefore he deserves all the plaudits. Yeah, it absolutely does. And you kind of think, you know, players always put in that sort of shift, don't they, when they're returning to their old club and in the first season, you know, after they've left and they're always going to put in that shift. They don't always do that. They don't always put that shift in and, you know, they will try and sometimes, you know, ex-Liverpool players, you will worry about them, you know, um, when they're playing against Liverpool just because there's always that little edge, isn't there, that they've got because they've been there and they really want to, you know, they want to win against the former club. Now, with Jota, he showed that last night, but he shows that every game. Like, he's, he is, like, I think he's young enough to just still have that. You can see the football is just a joyous thing for him. He just loves playing and he, he runs with that energy. And that's the kind of energy I think that Liverpool's front three have always had. You know, that kind of, like, Mane just looks like, sometimes, like, he's a kid just really enjoying himself. And the same goes for Firmino and Salah, you know, in the past few years and... You know, with Firmino now sort of dropping off and not maybe providing that little bit of, you know, um, I don't know, just what Liverpool need in terms of he'll have, you know, one great touch sublime, the best touch you'll ever see in your life. But then he'll, you know, just lose the ball when he's, you know, he's got loads of space. And um, I think Jota will lose the ball as well. Um, but he just, at the minute, having him back, I think is massive for Liverpool because He's come in with that fresh energy. The mindset is just totally... Um, it's not like... I don't think he lets it get to him as though, you know, like you, you see last night when you said it gets to 65 minutes and they were willing to grind out the game. But then there was also those moments where you thought, can they do this? Because you kind of like... Kind of said the body language does kind of... Just because we've watched it this season, I think you think back to the Leicester game and you think and it can go that way. Um, I know, obviously, Jota got substituted... In the end, I think, you know, what a return to to his, his, the place, you know, he used to score score for fun. I think he's he, behind Raul Jimenez. He scored more goals there than, than anyone else. Um, you know, it was his home and he, he made it look like that last night. Um, and I think, you know, he'll do that to teams for a long time to come. That was his 10th goal, really, by now, without that four months was a hiatus. I think he'd be on 20 and he'd be, you know, getting talked about as player of the season, quite frankly, the way he started that and, you know, having that big gap. But then what's more, I think, impressive with him is how he's just come back from just a long time out where a player shouldn't come back with that kind of, um, I don't know, just looking exactly like he left the field. He's just come right back to it. And I think that speaks for, you know, his own sort of mentality and how he plays the game. But, you know, no Liverpool fan could have guessed this time last season that he'd be playing for Liverpool. I don't think there'd be maybe a handful of them who could. Um, but no one would give him away now, would they? What, what a footballer he's turning out to be. He is absolutely flying, Gareth Jota. What I think is interesting throughout the game, as I say, is when the, the, the front three, they were all often in, in the positions where you'd want them. Mane over the course of the game, there's loads of interesting stuff, to be honest with you, where he's where he needs to be. He'll often do the first thing really, really well. The run he makes for could be a penalty, could round the keeper and score, could think the keeper, could just put it in. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And it feels to me like he's just in his own head in the next phase. So he's doing the instinctive thing right, the movement's right, the train thing's right, and then he's in his own head. And that was right the way up to the end of the game when he loses the ball in a really mad scenario around their penalty area that leads to Traore running through and, and winning the national. All of that sort of comes through from, from, from Sadio's own mindset where he's just, he was like he was overwhelmed with options. And I, I do sort of feel as though he could do with starting the game soon and having something go right for him in the next 10 so he can just relax. Because to me, he remains the one who looks the least relaxed. Yeah, you, you can see the you can see the wills there, and and I think the uh, the reaction to his performance is dead interesting. So some people have talked him right up, and other people have talked him right down, and and the truth is somewhere in between because I think you know he was a threat and and he was taking people on, and you know you probably sit down with Wolves players and they were like, oh well, he was, he was a nightmare, you know, he, he kept skipping <laughs> past us, and you know he was hard to deal with, and he was in pockets of space that you know he, he popped up in. As you say, you know, sort of seventy-five percent was was right with them, 
But then, you know, the other bits, you were, I mean, I, I, I'm still baffled how he doesn't score that chance. Do you know what I mean? It, it's mm. guilt hedged and, it, and it, it's it's one that should be ending up in the back of the net. And I know there's a little bit of debate about the keeper gets a touch on him and should he be more streetwise and should he be more clever? Like, I don't think that debate should exist. The ball should be in the back of the net. You said that he should think the keeper. It, it's on. And, and we've seen him do it and we know he's capable of it and the ball the ball should be bulging in the back of the net. There shouldn't be a debate about staying on your defeat on your feet and a penalty and all the rest of it. So that was mad. He had the other one as well, didn't he? From um a great little ball from Trent and he added that one wide. And as you say, all night he was, it was he was just odd. I think there was bits of that from some of the other players as well, though. So almost I'm I'm saying it into a positive to say that we've won, but also you know there's another level in there for Oh them. yeah. Um, so you know, there's another level from Mane, as you're saying there, uh, rightly. I think there's still another level from Mo. I thought he did all right. He was a little bit quiet, but I mean, he has that chance at the end where he gets. A, he's in the box. He's got a bit of time. Mm. He, he makes the right decision in terms of yes, Bender in the top corner, Mo. But then it's quite a way off. And, and again, you seem like for an ordinary player, you'd be like, okay, well. That's only half a chance. For Mo, it's a chance because Mo puts them away, and he doesn't put that away. And I'm like, well, it's still not, it's still not Mo at his very best. And you know, Kev said before Robertson as well. You know, I defend Robertson to the hilt. I absolutely love him, and I think in terms of like grit, determination, getting stuck in on Triori at times and things like that, absolutely brilliant. And he's still bombing up and down like he he will do seemingly forever. Um, but I, I thought in the final third a couple of times he was off. You know, he he just he was in good positions and he, he didn't quite pick the ball that you know he can pick. So I, I think you know the the overall funk that they've been through is still affecting them collectively and individually. And, and Mane is the probably the biggest statement funk person currently. Uh, but 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 it, it it's affecting them all a little bit. I think still, and it will do. And what 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 they need to do is string some results together. I, I think all season long we've had the thing where we go, okay, that's the one, that's the result. Mm. And now it'll roll on, and they can they can string together you know a few results, and then they haven't they haven't done that. I mean, even in the reverse fixture, uh, you know when we had some fans in, we beat them four 0 and we were good, and, and we you know well deserving of that result. And you're like, okay, here we go, and then we didn't. Here we go, you know, and same when we beat <laughs> Tottenham, and say same when we beat Palace. It, it, it's just been a little bit bitty. Like if there's any time to find the run of form, it's now. Do you know what I mean? And Look, it's still an outside chance for Liverpool to recover in the league and get where we want them to be in terms of Champions League qualification. But I, I'm I'm just glad that we're sort of lurking there and worrying those other sides now because, you know, I, I know that if you do the form and all the rest of it, and I've been looking at it myself this morning, and, you know, Chelsea's form since the turn of the year is fantastic. Liverpool's obviously isn't. West Ham's isn't bad. But all those sides in and around the top four, bar us, it seems. You know, we're all playing each other. West Ham play Chelsea, Chelsea play Leicester. You know, we, we've we got to go to Old Trafford. Uh, we've got to play Arsenal. Arsenal play everyone, it seems. You know, Arsenal have, got a, <laughs> Arsenal have got a say in all of this. But I just think, I'm just so glad that we've given ourselves a chance. And, we, and we've given, you know, we've given the likes of Mane a chance to, to, to be himself, to show what he really can do. And if he, if he can hit form, if, if Mo can hit form, if Robertson could maybe get a rest at some point, that'd be nice. He's got to go off and captain Scotland now instead. But you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I just think if they can reset themselves and rediscover what they're capable of, then who knows? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely like, you know, why not European Cup number seven? Why not top four? We've seen Liverpool do mad things before. They can do them again. Um. In terms of seeing it out, the other thing he's got and he's getting back together and we'll hopefully have even more of Kev the other side of the three-week break, break all of a sudden as a bench. And I think his use of the bench last night, he's had some criticism at times, for, not least from the Anfield rap, to be fair, you know, in terms of you looking at the subs sometimes and you're not sure. I always feel like subs are a bit more of a lottery than we think because they're like this world of potential things that can happen. Uh, whereas the reality is a football the player is probably going to come on and struggle to get to the pace of the game for a while. But I think all three do really, really well. I was surprised, no Jones, but Milner was really what was required in hindsight. I think Keita looked really lively. And Oxlade-Chamberlain was absolutely electrifying. Um, it was it, it, it came from absolutely nowhere, but suddenly he was everywhere all over the pitch. And, you know, I thought that all three subs played the part that the manager will be really pleased with. Yeah, definitely. And it's nice to see three subs coming on. You think... Each one of them is a decent player, whereas 
some of the benches we've seen in over recent weeks, and there's there's names you Google and to see where does he play, to, and that's that hopefully is not going to be happening towards the end of the season. Now, I thought the substitutions yesterday were exactly what was called for at the right times. So I thought the two the two he done first, Thiago needed to come off. He had, he had the yellow card, and he done well, but it was. It, He's a bit of an accident waiting to happen once he's on that first yellow card. So I was, I was absolutely fine with that. Naby Keita, when he come on, I thought, again, done really well and was probably one of the substitutions when you think, what do the opposition not want to see? Well, I would have thought mm. probably they don't want to see Naby Keita coming on and playing sort of in between the lines. And he, he put a couple of balls through, didn't he? I think he put one through for Salah. Um, he's, got, he's got that potential to do it. And or actually, Chamberlain, I just I feel like he's just had... A, a near of a false start since 2018. When, when he got that knee injury against Roma, he was absolutely flying. And every time he comes back, I just think, come on, lad, make this be the one we, we, it works for you. And I still think he's a he's a midfielder, really. But that sort of central attacking role, where effectively you're not asking them to score goals, what you're really asking them to do is just chase down every single time that they've got the ball and don't let them play out from the back. I think that's it's perfect for him. And if that's what it takes to play him into a little bit of form and a little bit of confidence, that, that's sound for it to do. And by the time we come back from this international break, hopefully with another couple back in and around the squad, you start looking and going, OK, we can make a few changes for games and still be as strong, if not yeah. stronger, coming off the bench. Now, that then obviously bodes very well for thinking, OK, we can make changes in a game and affect the game. Whereas this season... What we're really doing with most changes is just, oh, it's a bit of a Hail Mary. Nine times out of ten, if we really need something, we're throwing someone on saying, please, please, please. Whereas if you've got a few more players back, and in fact, even substitutions like last night, you can make more tactical substitutions. And for a manager like Jürgen Klopp, I think that's worth a lot. Um, the injuries to the goalkeeper hugely disrupts the way in which the game's going to finish, Kiva. The first thing to point out, uh, post-match, Wolves, Wolves' manager was quite clear that the, you know, he's, he's conscious and, and they felt he was broadly all right. It was quite disturbing to see. It was a little bit of a reminder. I felt sorry for everyone involved, really. Camera kept cutting to Jimenez as well, who could probably have done without uh, having a big repeat of what happened to him and having to look at that before his very eyes. Um, but it does disrupt the match and Liverpool do well I think just to hold themselves in because you never know what you're going to get from Wolves after that they've just watched their goalkeeper their really good mate have this terrible thing happen to him I thought they react well but Liverpool react well to what was pretty unpleasant and and obviously ruined the idea of where the match was up to in terms of a sense of time Yeah it did it was it was weird because you couldn't figure it out yourself I was wondering I think when it got to like 100 and I think the game restarted soon after that I was thinking, how many minutes then? Because how many minutes was left? And then they've added on seven. And I was like, so there's just seven. To, like, my head was just gone. I was, like, baffled by it. But obviously, you know, it's great that Rui Patricio is is okay by all accounts. Um, you know, because it, it, that was a worrying thing. And Wolves players have been through that before. And you could kind of see them all sort of, like, not wanting to be over there because I think they didn't really want to see what was going on in a way. Or that maybe they saw that... Maybe, you know, the, the word coming out that he was all right and all that was just precautionary. Um, but, yeah, I think when it when it panned to, to Raul Jimenez, who obviously is a massive loss to, to Wolves and just how they play, you could see the, the, the big scar on his head and it was just mm. like, well, it's, you know, I think it was quite a sort of disturbing sort of time, wasn't it? It felt like it just went on forever. And the players were all sort of just having a nice little chat and stuff and... You know, you could see Oxley Chamberlain chatting to um, Gibbs Weiss, I think, was it, and, and other players chatting. But then to, to then become mates and then have to go and play that game as enemies for the last few minutes was just a mad thing, wasn't it? Because I think everyone was kind of thinking, God, I hope, I hope he's OK. Um, and then and Wolves looked like they might actually profit on that. Um, I think there was a, a couple of dangerous chances wasn't there towards the end of it Liverpool managed to just sort of you know steer it away and um, I think now Phillips got a really good um just sort of like karate kick the ball out the box didn't he at one point um but I think those sort of stoppages are can just disrupt you know how you how you're playing and um I think you know that offside rule needs to be looked at like I know Salah was pretty close but there's there's ones where it's a lot further away and you know that he's offside. Just I don't understand why they can't just raise the flag. This being a massive example of why it can go wrong, you know. Um, albeit Salah was it was, I mean, tighter than other ones we've seen. Yeah. 
Um, and then, you know, I think the concussion thing's a really positive thing for football, isn't it? Because obviously not only do Wolves get to make, you know, bring John Ruddy on, but then Liverpool get to make a substitute, which I think threatened to be Curtis Jones, but then it wasn't in the end. I think Klopp just thought, let's just keep them lads on the pitch and just sort of, you know, let them ride out what was a mad few last minutes where you could almost feel like Wolves were going to score in the very last second. And you could hear the headlines of, you know, Wolves scored in the 107th minute. You could feel it. But then, you know, something in this Liverpool team just dug in and prevented that. And I think that's the biggest positive from last night. Get in, get the fuck in, well in Reds, uh, the Reds have won, the Reds have won 1-0, the Reds are up to six, the Reds are only five points behind Chelsea and fourth, we finally scored a goal in the first half, Martin Tyler's a boring bastard, uh, I'm Gareth Roberts, I've got Sean Bennett and I've got Jay McKenna with me and we're going to talk about the match and we're probably going to talk about Martin Tyler as well because we've just been talking about him now, it is time to put him out to pasture, he is one boring bastard and he made that match an absolute grind, but... but <laughs> But Charm, we won. And we scored a we goal. Won. Honestly, the positives I've took from that are endless, apart from, yeah, as you say, Martin Tyler. I wish, I wish he, he opened like you did then and just when we <laughs> scored, doesn't say not an all game and just goes, get the fuck in. And that, that's it. That's all I'm that's all I'm asking for. Just a bit of life. But yeah, that was uh that was dire. But I know it was a bit of a tiny bit of a non non event game. But look, we got goal in the first half, which was uh yeah, a rare, a rare occurrence. And I'm I'm just glad he's uh, Klopp stuck to this centre back partnership now. I think um, you know he, he's kind of committed to that Fabinho thing, and I think he was because uh, he'd said it, he didn't want to go back on it. But I think I can just see Kabak really growing in, in confidence. At one point, did you see him like dribbling on the halfway line, and he, he tried to chip uh, Bolly? I think it was. <laughs> I thought, go ahead, doing like a little a little math up there, but. Uh, and then the goal come, started from a Phillips header, didn't it? So, like like all good things in life, it starts from that Phillips head in the footy, doesn't it? Um, so, yeah, it was good. Enjoyed it. Three points, and we're only five points off off uh, fourth now, aren't fourth, we? So, yeah. as, as, as Klopp said, it's, uh, don't worry about what they're doing. If we just win our games, then we've, we've got a show, haven't we? Yeah, and Jay, it feels a bit mad to sort of pick apart the, the performance because it was just about winning, wasn't it? I mean, we've got this three-week break now. And it was just, you know, it was the classic just fucking win Liverpool and they won. You know, you can pick apart the performance and you can say it was bitty and they did this and they did that and they should have been out of sight and Wolves are unlucky and maybe they think they should have drawn and, you know, all of those things. But kind of not arsed. It was just about winning, wasn't it, mate? Looking ahead to the next season uh, is what we're going to be doing and to the rest of this season is what we're going to, going to be doing a lot of on the Anfield Wrap uh, across the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, do subscribe to theanfieldwrap.com forward slash subscribe for that. Loads of draw reaction on Friday lined up uh, and then on top of that as well, as I say, uh, looking ahead to next season to look at what Liverpool maybe need to do a little bit differently uh, to address a couple of bits and pieces uh, and to begin that process of reviewing this campaign. Although there is still a long way to go and as Gareth points, has pointed out, Gareth, a couple of times over this they do suddenly look like a football team again time suddenly moves everything on again uh, the international break is not existent for some which is a good thing it could tail for others not necessarily a bad thing there are some like Kabak and Robertson who will almost certainly play three games in the international break so it is worth remembering that but they ultimately could do with winning at Anfield uh, again pretty soon but there does look to be a pathway out of the gloom now and a pathway towards being able to if nothing else finish the season as strongly as possible yeah, um, I mean it's it depends what you want to how you want to look at it. I think at the moment, and and look, we're all different, and 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 sometimes you know, and I'm guilty of it as well. We can get preachy towards other supporters about how they should look at circumstances and, and what they should do and what they should say and how they should feel about it. But we've given ourselves a chance, haven't we? And, and that's the main thing. I think um, when I was going through Everton before, and I, I was thinking about the Anfield thing, same as you've just said there, we do need to get that back. Uh, albeit that it is pandemic football, so it's still not Anfield as we know it. It's still not Anfield with fans. It's still not a packed cop. I kind of think, I kind of hope that that will put a lot of things right in terms of our home record when football resumes as we know and love it. But in the meantime, they've got to crack on with how it is. Uh, they've got five away, five away and four at home of the, of the nine that are left. Uh, so may, maybe that's a good thing. Um, but but there is there is there is certainly a, a sort of monkey on the back now about Anfield. I think it feeds into the opposition as well in that they think they have a chance. 
Whereas equally, when we were in that in the middle of that unbelievable run, I imagine it feeds into the opposition that they think they've got no chance. So, you know, we've got to turn that round as well. But I think I think we've seen enough over the last couple of games to suggest that, you know, the spirit's not in the sky quite yet, but it, it, it's on the way up. Things things are looking better. The unchanged side is is a good thing. I think as Kev pointed out before, you know, you've never seen players sort of play together and get worse. They play together and get better, you know, understandings improve. Mm. Um I thought we regressed a little bit in terms of midfield last night in that Thiago was mad again and, and decided to run round and be, you know, Paul Scholes. Um if he could jib I mean, that, you just... know, I've decided I'm just I'm just I'm on ball, Gareth, to be honest. I mean, you you know, if, if other people aren't into it, that's fine. I understand that, but I'm getting into it now. I think I think he's just decided <laughs> I'm just gonna wallop people a bit. <laughs> Let them know what I'm about. He's just not that good at it though, is he? Because you know, like where like there was a spell I thought last night there for about ten minutes or so where Fabinho was feet peak Fabinho, he was just winning the ball in the right place. When he wasn't in the right place, he'd, he'd, put, he'd bang in a recovery tackle and it was like, yeah, you do that bit, mate. And, and you know, you, Thiago, you don't do that. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the he's thing... He's high where, risk, don't get me wrong. He's yeah. high risk, he's high risk, but he's high rewards. I mean, <laughs> he's got, he's got, he's got an, an incredible repertoire of faces to say, what? When he's thrown in the worst <laughs> tackle ever, uh, you know, fair play to him for that. But yeah, um, look, as I've said all the way through this, really, I, I think we've given ourselves a chance now, and that, and that in itself is exciting. I think you know we we needed some we needed some kind of light to to show us a way out of this gloom, and, and we've got it. The last two games, we've got the Champions League draw to look forward to. Uh, on Friday, we can we can take in the games, you know, tonight and stuff, and see where other teams are at, and and, and imagine how it might all unfold. Uh, we can get, get romantic about the fact that the final is in Istanbul, and we can think about these final nine league games, and we can you know we can go forever through fixture lists and look at what the other teams have got and go, okay, well they'll get beat there, and we'll win this, and just waiting to see which media organisation is first to put up the. You know, the thing where you predict all the results and you get a league table at the end. I mean, it's only a matter of time, isn't it, before we can all have a go on one of them. And then we say Liverpool win every game and Chelsea <laughs> lose every game. And we, Oh, look, so I'm a top four there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, look, look I'm, I'm just glad that there's stuff to be positive about again because it's been a grind, it's been grim, um, and it has been for them as well. And it's just nice again to see, you know, players po- being positive. I thought Jota's interview last night was quality. Uh, the manager seeming a bit more positive, obviously seeming a bit more himself, uh, being a grim time for him professionally and personally. So you know, good to see him with something to be positive about. So look, you know, right now the ship is turning round and it's pointing in the right direction. And let's hope we end up where we want to end up. Even just on uh, the the draw on Friday, it's it's the last eight of the Champions League, so there are no easy draws, but there are easier ones. It's fair to say, and there is also. It may not suit Liverpool at the moment to get an English side if Chelsea uh, progress and you expect Manchester City to. Manchester City are obviously a really, really good team, but Chelsea look like a really good team. But I think it's more than that at the minute. It feels as though Liverpool, for Liverpool currently, it may well be that a change is as good as a rest. And the idea of, even if it is, for instance, the mighty Bayern Munich, the reigning champions, it may well suit Liverpool to get a side that they're not used to playing, a side that isn't used to playing them, a side that hasn't watched their their struggles in English football this season and can plan accordingly. Maybe I'm wrong, but I I am sort of of the view, you know, there's lots of things that you want in European draws under normal circumstances, uh, but stuff like where the home leg is first or second is less significant, it feels, at the moment. Maybe, just maybe, the idea of an English side or a non-English side is as significant for Liverpool. Yeah, I think um, fans are sort of would dread a, a game against Man City, but then I think that's because there's no fans and that kind of control is lost, isn't it, against the yeah. City team who are like a just training ground team, aren't they really? They're relentless with or without fans. They just play the same way all the time, where I feel like Liverpool do really get their style of play and everything can be... The tone can be set at Anfield by, you know, that first sort of big sort of raw corner um, a kickoff like you just see you, you can think about like Andy Robertson just setting off down the wing and you know he's sort of fulfilled with that like um, just in him you know the, the crowd the feeding off that that 
that positivity. Um, with all that loss, it's going to be much more difficult for Liverpool. So you would, obviously, you know, the games might be played again in Budapest or wherever. Um, we're yet to sort of see see what will happen there. But, you know, Liverpool have, have beat Man City. You know, they have beat Bayern Munich. Porto would be nice, wouldn't it? I mean, um, a trip out there would be nice if we could all get there. But obviously, you know, Things aren't looking quite that way, but Liverpool's record against them is brilliant. But, you know, this Liverpool team now, it's kind of like a good record against a team stands for nothing anymore. So you kind of worry maybe they just need to play against the the toughest team. Maybe, you know, PSG, let Mbappe run it, Kabak and Phillips, and we'll see where we're at, you know, um, going into that second leg. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of a good draw, I don't... I don't really think Liverpool have ever needed needed a good draw or an easy draw. Other teams might benefit from it more so. But I don't know. There's something in Liverpool that it doesn't matter who they're up against. They're going to give something, especially in European football. But then, you know, that comes back to what we were speaking about there. Without the fans, you kind of lose that little, you know, that 12th man, that edge. Um so maybe the easiest route to the final would be the best one. But then, you know, they're going to have to beat these teams at some point. So why not get them? And then, you know, you beat Bayern Munich in the quarterfinals. You know, the, they're knocked out. Thiago's there doing all his mad faces. And and Liverpool is through to the semis. And I think that's then people start going, well, hang on. You know, they've just done that. So I think the bigger the better for Liverpool. Um, because if you're going to go out, you'd rather go out to to a team like Bayern or, you know, PSG. Um, definitely wouldn't want to go out to Man City because I think psychologically then that affects them going into next season a little bit just with Man City having beat them at Anfield and just having that little sort of role reversal um, in terms of fortune. So just don't want to see them anywhere near Liverpool. You bother do we get, Kev? Yeah, I can't be arsed with Man City. Fuck them. <laughs> Give us Porto, they're shite, aren't they? So... Go get them, absolutely tonk them. And then... I can't believe Porto are going to pin your comments on the dressing room wall. They're going to pin this podcast onto the dressing room wall. Porto can kiss my ass. We'll, we'll pin our 5 nil through the year. Like Malcolm McDonald in the 74 Cup final. To, to be honest, I'd rather, if, even if it goes that way, though, I'd rather get beat by Porto than Man City. I just I don't want them to have any... I feel like they're the team that's benefiting most from having no fans in. And I just don't want them to have a, a boss Anfield victory in the European Cup. Because they won't care if it's fans there or not. They'll just say, well, we, we did this. And sometimes, like, nine times I said, I'd say it doesn't matter what other people think, but it's just to have that psychological edge. I don't want them to have that at all. And also, the more players we get back and the more we play as a team, the more anything can happen in this competition. And I agree. You play someone like Man City now or even a Bayern Munich or PSG. Listen, we, I'm not saying we couldn't beat them. We certainly could, but... It's a, it's a tough task, and it's certainly a tough task with a team that hasn't played together. So, give us as easy a run to the final as we can possibly get, and let's see if we can get to Istanbul with Kabak and Phillips having played ten games next to each other, and then you really don't ever know, do you? You never know, indeed. Listen, thank you very much indeed to Gareth Roberts, to Kiva O'Neill from the Athletic, and to Kev Walsh for the Anfield wrap this week. It's been an absolute pleasure, a pleasure to talk about a Liverpool victory. Uh, whatever you're doing for the rest of this week, whatever you're up to, may all of your wins be dirty.